In this course, we're primarily going to talk about supervised learning or predictive modeling. We'll start off by talking about the overall purpose of predictive modeling. And since we'll be doing a lot of you know, model development in this course, we'll think about in the real world, when is it appropriate to actually develop a new supervised learning model versus when is it not? We'll talk a little bit of, in detail about, you know, is a predictive model needed for a given situation? And if you determine that, yes, in fact, a model is needed and that you should develop a model for the situation, we'll talk about some common problems that you'll encounter when you go to train a predictive model or when you go to apply the model to a data set. We'll talk about a step-by-step -step process for training and fitting models. And then we won't cover it in this video, but we will talk about uh, handling missing values and tuning models in a subsequent video. We'll have a separate lecture series that talk about the common algorithms for modeling typical clinical data and how they work. So we will cover logistic regression models, support vector machines, decision trees. We'll uh, talk about some common ensemble models, which includes concepts of bagging and boosting, which we'll cover in those talks. And the specific ensemble models we'll talk about are bagged trees, random forests, and boosted trees. The expectation for you is not for you to be able to understand the math of how these different algorithms work, at least for this course. What's going to be more important is for you to be able to um, understand them conceptually. So how, you know, when is it appropriate to develop a machine learning model and to be able to run the code that we learn to actually fit a model on a data set, apply that model to a data set, and then interpret the performance of the model. And rather than learning you know, several different uh, functions that are separate for different types of models, I'll be teaching you a consistent interface for dealing with predictive models uh, known as tidy models, which is a meta package for machine learning that uh, allows you to share a lot of code even when you're applying uh, your code to different types of models. So what is the purpose of a supervised learning model? The general idea is that given a set of cases or examples, the purpose of a supervised learning model is to learn a representation of data that contains predictors and outcome variables, and to use this representation to be able to predict outcomes for new cases when you're given only the predictors. So as an example, this on the right is a data set uh, from the uh, Pima Indians data set. So it has data on uh, women that, were, uh, that are Pima Indians and their risk for developing diabetes. There are several predictor variables in this data set, such as body mass index, uh, family history, which is coded as a continuous uh, variable uh, known as the diabetes pedigree function, and a woman's age. And so the idea here would be that if you were going to try to predict this outcome variable, that you'd want to learn a representation of the data such that if you were uh, shown the information for a new woman not in this data set for whom you have access to the BMI, the pedigree function, and the age, that you could offer some prediction of what you think the outcome is going to be for that particular woman. There are a lot of common misconceptions that I want to start off by clarifying before we dig in any deeper into uh, supervised learning, which the first one is that there is this misconception that machine learning models perform better than traditional statistical models. So in reality, in most real world situations, the performance between machine learning models, such as random forests, and traditional statistical models uh, 
such as logistic regression, is fairly similar. So when I refer to machine learning models or supervised learning models, I'm actually including logistic regression and kind of traditional statistical models within that bucket. That is something that's not, I would say, accepted in the statistical community uh, who views machine learning and you know, regression-based methods as being quite different. But in the machine learning community, where the focus is on predictive modeling, you can use a traditional model or a tree-based model to achieve the same objective. And so I would say that they are just different ways of representing the same data. Another common misconception is that in machine learning models, somehow the quote unquote machine does the learning for you. So I wanna you know, again make the same point that in both machine learning and statistical models, you learn a representation of the data. In a logistic regression model, that representation is a series of coefficients and an intercept. In a random forest model, that representation is a set of decision trees that when put together, constitute a model that can make predictions on new data, just as a logistic regression model would. So in other words, the point I'm trying to get across is that Supervised learning is often referred to as a curve fitting exercise, meaning given a data set, you're often trying to learn an optimal curve uh, that will model that data set. And both statistical and machine learning models can get you there. There is another common misconception that linear models can only learn linear relationships, whereas machine learning models can learn sophisticated curvilinear relationships. So while it is true that linear models by themselves do learn linear relationships, there are many mechanisms to model nonlinear data using linear models. And so anyone who kind of does a very naive comparison between a linear regression model and a uh, machine learning model where the machine learning model performs a lot better, there's a chance in all likelihood that their linear model is not specified in the same way that a, uh, you know, a statistician or someone with more knowledge about how to model nonlinear data with linear models would have handled that linear modeling. The last misconception I think is that unlike statistical models, there is some notion out there that machine learning models predict the future, in quotes. Um, and that's just simply not true. Again, both statistical models and machine learning models predict an outcome or a series of outcomes using a set of predictors. If that outcome is an outcome that happens in the future, then great, your model is trying to model and predict something in the future. But if that outcome is in the present or in the past, your model doesn't know that. And so, you know, there's nothing special about the future that machine learning models can do that statistical models cannot. So this question often comes up uh, when you are reading a paper that describes the development of a new supervised learning model. And that question is, should this researcher have developed a new model in the first place? So there's this nice algorithm that uh, Martin Van Smetten has put together, uh, a statistician with a focus on predictive modeling, that is a nice decision tree of when you should develop a new risk prediction model. So the first question he asks is, is prediction even needed? And obviously if it's not, then stop. We'll address that on the next slide as to is prediction needed? If it is needed, who needs it? If you can identify a key audience for whom this prediction would be helpful, then go ahead and proceed to the next step. And if it would be useful, um, what information would you need to be able to make that prediction? 
Like, do you have data on the types of patients that you would need to develop such a model? And if the answer is yes, then the next thing is really to look for, is there already an existing uh, model out there? So I think one of the most common phenomena is that there are multiple models that are in the literature describing the same set of predictors and the same outcome without any acknowledgement or comparison to the other models that are already out there. So, you know, it's pretty good practice to look and see, is there an existing model out there? And if you think the answer is no, then, you know, his advice is check again, because, you know, again, this is such a big problem that uh, various groups will publish models doing very similar things without any cross-checking uh, with other models. The next question is, if you don't find any kind of model out there, um, then you actually uh, may want to go ahead and see, do you have a large enough data set to develop a model? And if you do, and you've got the predictors that you need, then go ahead and proceed. But keep in mind that, you know, there's a, a lot of things that uh, you have to consider to build a model that is not only performing well, but is well calibrated um, and is going to perform well on the intended audience uh, on whom it's going to be used. On the other hand, if you find an existing predictive model that's out there and you've got a new data set, then by all means, you should try to evaluate that existing model on your data set. And if you find it doesn't perform well, you may want to update it and there are several ways to update models that we won't cover in this course, or you may want to go ahead and refit your data on that, you know, or, or your, uh, a new model on your data um, if the existing model uh, doesn't perform well. So that's kind of the overall workflow of should you develop a new model to make predictions and when. So that first question was, is a prediction even needed? So I think the key thing here really is um, one that has to do with impact. So if you could predict the outcome, what would you do with that information? And let's think through a few scenarios. So if you could predict which patients are going to develop diabetes within the next year, are there interventions that you could deliver to them to try to lower their risk of developing diabetes? Maybe those are patients that you bring into clinic sooner. Maybe those are patients who you monitor more intensely. Or maybe those are patients who you uh, reach out to uh, to titrate their medications more carefully uh, in the next year. If you could predict which patients were going to develop sepsis in the next three hours, what might you do? Um, and I would argue that if you knew that in the next three hours, those are patients in whom you might want to draw blood cultures, send blood tests, um, and monitor more closely, potentially having a nurse take a more frequent look at that patient, um, because those are patients that if they do develop sepsis, will require a, a lot more intensive care. So let's say you could predict which patients were going to be transferred to an intensive care unit within the next three hours. What would you do with that information? So I think you know that one's a little bit more tricky because you could argue that one appropriate thing that you might wanna do is actually transfer them sooner. Um, another thing that you might wanna do is try to prevent them from going to the ICU by stabilizing them you know, uh, in their current room. And I think your answer is going to depend on what the capabilities are of your hospital system uh, and what the capabilities are uh, in your intensive care unit. But you can see how, depending on what you're going to do with that information, you might decide that you actually need a model versus maybe you don't need a model. Um, what if you could pres uh, predict which patients were going to die in the next 10 years? Um, so there are you know, a lot of commonly available life expectancy models that try to make a prediction similar to this. Um, and one thing that you might do with that information is you might use it to decide you know, who is not in need of preventive screening measures. Because for most preventive measures like colonoscopy, uh, 
you typically only you know, do those kinds of measures uh, for screening purposes when you know that a patient's going to live long enough to reap the benefits of that screening.